Hello everyone. Welcome to our Main Street Church of the Nazarene Father's Day service. Special welcome to all you fathers. We want to honor you today. The message that will follow is especially crafted for you, but it's also meant for the whole family. So I hope that if there are children in your home, especially older children and teens, that you will gather them together to learn lessons from a Bible character who has certainly got a lot to teach us, namely Daniel. Times have changed, but one thing that hasn't changed since Daniel's time is the principle of standing strong and true for what's right when the pressure is on to do the wrong thing. And that applies to all ages. Now, before the scripture is read and you hear that message on Daniel, please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our perfect Father from whom all blessings flow. And one of those blessings is your plan for families. Right from the start, it was your plan for a husband and wife to live together in love and out of that love to bring forth children. Today, we think of fathers especially. Thank you for the attributes you give fathers, everything they need to fulfill their calling. I pray that they will continually look to you for help that they need to lead by their example and by their words. May they have a continual desire to be in your word, growing in you, so that they have something to give their children. May they live out the discipline of a prayer life and teach their children how to pray, because your word says, the earnest, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Lord, help dads to love their wives, and in doing that, to bring a sense of security to the whole family. Help them to balance the demands of work with the demands of home. May kids know they are precious and not a burden to their, to their fathers. I pray these things for all fathers and father figures. It's a tall order to be a dad, but may they always remember that they have you, their perfect Heavenly Father, to help them. If you have called them to this honorable status, you will equip them as they look to you for that equipping. I pray that you will help us as wives and children to respect the husbands and dads in our lives. Help us to give them the honor their position deserves. I pray for everyone who has lost a father recently or every father who's lost a child. Give them comfort and remind them of the good memories. And Lord, I pray for other situations that concern us today, whether in our homes or elsewhere. May we look to you, the only one who knows all about it, because you are present everywhere, and you are all wise, kind, loving, and forgiving. May your blessing be on this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the, the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food, and treat your servants in accordance with what, the, with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. 
So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Living the Christian life in this world is a challenge. It's hard at times to make godly decisions. But there comes the time and a place when we're forced to make difficult decisions that impact the rest of our lives. I doubt there's a parent here today who wouldn't like to sit down with their child and say these words. You're going to be thrown into situations where you will have to stand up for what is right. Sometimes you will need to say no, and that's going to take guts. But you'll need to do that if you want God to bless your life. I wonder if we could pass along only one character trait to our children. What would we choose? Which single attribute above all others would you identify as being paramount? I think an excellent one would be courage. Throughout the Bible, we find the following instruction given to God's people. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Take heart. Take courage. This is a lesson for all of us. I can think of no better place to observe this in action than in the life of Daniel. From his remarkable life, we can draw out several principles. Here's what happened to Daniel. The date, 605 BC. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, besieged Jerusalem. He removed several articles from the temple of God. He also took about 70 young men from Judah's royal family and nobility. Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were among the captives. The Hebrew term translated young men in Daniel 1 verse 4 normally denotes males from the ages of 14 through 17. They were mature enough to be taken from home but young enough to be educated to new patterns of thought. So Daniel was probably, they figure, around 14 years old. Immediately, court officials immersed these captives into Babylonian culture. The first thing Nebuchadnezzar did was change their names. They were given pagan names. These boys were then enrolled in the University of Babylon for a three-year crash course of study. At the end of this time, they were to have learned the entire Chaldean language and all the wisdom of Babylon, including astronomy, astrology, and architecture. Nebuchadnezzar intended to so immerse these young men in the culture of Babylon that nothing would remind them of their former life. He wanted them to forget Judah, Forget the temple, forget their godly homes, forget all that was theirs as Jewish boys. Think of what is happening. Here was a 14-year-old boy that was sent into a pagan culture, exposed to powerful, ungodly influences, and subjected to intense, very intense pressure. Imagine sending your own 14-year-old child to the University of Beijing and abandoning him there to the teaching of communistic China. You then have some idea of Daniel's predicament. Inevitably, the day came when Daniel was ordered to violate his conscience and abandon his commitment to Almighty God. His dilemma is described for us in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 5, where we read these words. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and the wine which he drank. Somewhere along the way, Daniel had learned that it is never right to do wrong in order to do right. Politely, respectfully, this teen refused to comply with the king's command. Now, Daniel could have thought, wait a minute, I'm only a kid. I mean, after all, God, what do you expect? 
I haven't had a chance to mature in my faith. Or he could have thought, I'm away from home. I'm away from the temple. I, I, I'm away from my parents. I'm uh, in a foreign land, hundreds of miles from home. Nobody will know. We could have thought, we're in the minority. It doesn't feel good. I don't like being in the minority. To add to his troubles, Daniel also knew that if he disobeyed, he would probably uh, wouldn't be around very long. You see, he had learned about the palace rumors. Nebuchadnezzar liked to play with fire, especially with human beings as the fuel. One of his favorite indoor sports was to throw people into the furnace. The book of Jeremiah describes how Nebuchadnezzar forced observers to watch as he slowly roasted a man who displeased him. And talk about a tough boss. There was one. So when Daniel thought about his decision, certainly he must have given thought to what might happen to himself. However, despite all that, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor the wine which the king drank. Quietly, but firmly, he said no. He drew the line where God drew the line. Now remember that Daniel already had allowed the Babylonians to change his name. No fuss. Nor did he fight his enrollment in attending a Babylonian university. But when they tried to feed him the king's meat and wine, he said no. At that point, he courageously drew the line. You may be asking why. You might wonder, what's the difference? Why were the first two not a compromise, but the third one was? Here's the answer. The Old Testament contains no law against taking a name from another culture. In fact, it often happened. It did so with Joseph and Esther, and there were others. Likewise, there's no Old Testament prohibition about learning what other cultures have to teach. Moses did that. Acts 7.22 says that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and the same thing was true of Joseph. But the Old Testament did strongly prohibit eating unclean food and meat offered to idols. So that's where young Daniel took his stand. Where God said no, Daniel said no. He made up his mind to resist all the might of Babylon, all the threats of the most powerful man in the world at that time. And what amazes me, friends, is this. He did it as a young teen. Oh, how we need young people today who are willing to follow Daniel's example. We need adults as well. The world may try to blur the lines or deny they even exist. But if you want the blessing of God upon your children's lives, you had better find the courage and the authority to help them stand even as Daniel stood, to say even as Daniel said, I will not defile myself because God has said no. As I study the book that bears his name, I noticed at least five characteristics of Daniel's courage that I covet for all young people today, and indeed all adults. Number one, he was uncompromising. Daniel courageously said to one of the king's men, thank you very much for the invitation to eat at the king's table, but I have chosen not to defile myself with the king's food. You see, when we take our stand and draw the line, it's like firing the furnace of our intestinal fortitude. It enables us to take the next step and be firm. We can help our children do that by setting an example ourselves. It will give them the courage to take a stand when, when the tests come for them. Number two, he demonstrated courage and conviction. Number three, he maintained his courtesy. He could have done it in a caustic and belligerent way, but he did not do that. 
Verse 4, he exhibited confidence. He believed in the word of God. He, he put himself on the line for what he believed. He wasn't afraid to test his commitment before the whole kingdom. Number five, he maintained consistency. Consistency may be the most difficult of all. Most of us have our good moments, but consistency is a hard quality to exhibit day after day after day after day. After the dietary crisis blew over in Daniel chapter 1 verse 21 tells us Daniel continued until the first year of Darius, the ruler at that time. Daniel didn't make wise, didn't make wise decisions just some of the time or even most of the time. Daniel lived a consistent godly life for over 70 years in the midst of the corrupt Babylonian palace. Nebuchadnezzar came and went, but Daniel continued. Belshazzar came and went, Daniel continued. Darius came and went, Daniel continued. By the time Cyrus rose to power, Daniel was still there. He was still God's man in the place of influence. He remained the same through it all, calm, clear-eyed, consistent, courageous. What was the result of living like this? Well, God rewarded Daniel with a special impact. Number one, first of all, God gave him special influence in the court. The scripture says in Daniel chapter 1 verse 19, he served the king. You see, when Nebuchadnezzar saw how intelligent he was and how well he had done in his course of study, the king brought Daniel into the the royal court. Ultimately, he became the prime minister of the kingdom. Number two, Daniel was influential with his companions. Can you imagine what it must have been like to count Daniel among your buddies? What was it like for Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to be close friends to Daniel? Do you think, they, do you think he had an impact on them? You bet he did. We know that for certain by noting the stand that his buddies took later on in Daniel chapter 3. Number three, Daniel influenced his fellow captives. He remained a consistent leader throughout the captivity. He became the champion of his people in exile. The captives drew their strength from him. Who knows how many others took their cue from him and committed themselves to following God with courage, come what may. How did God prepare Daniel to be the champion that he was? <clears throat> what kind of home life produced a young man of such amazing courage and, and conviction? How can we be modern day Daniels? And how can we encourage our kids to do the same? God began his work in Daniel's life long before the Babylonian captivity. Years before Daniel arrived in Nebuchadnezzar's palace during his boyhood days, powerful, very powerful forces deeply influenced him. In his providence, God allowed Daniel to be born during the reign, you see, of King Josiah. Josiah was the first good king Judah had had in 57 years. Prior to him, wicked Manasseh had reigned for 55 years. He was succeeded for two years by his son, Ammon. Ammon was so evil that the servants in his own household conspired against him and murdered him. Then eight-year-old Josiah followed this awful mess to the throne. Second Chronicles 34 tells us that in the eighth year of his reign, Josiah began to seek after God. In the 12 years following, he purged Judah and Jerusalem of its idols, and under his leadership, one of the greatest revivals in human history took place. With Josiah on the throne and Jeremiah in the pulpit, Judah fell on her knees and ultimately returned to experiencing God's blessing, if only it was for a short period of time. All this was happening, little Daniel was running around as a prince in the royal court. 
There is good evidence he may have been related to King Zedekiah and therefore very much a part of the inner workings of that revival. While we are told nothing of Daniel's parents, they must have been so involved in the reform under Josiah and Jeremiah that when Daniel came to the palace in Babylon, he was ready to take his stand in an uncompromising way. God had been preparing him for all those days, for that, for that moment when he would stand alone. That, friends, must be our task with the children God has placed under our care. Not only parents, but any one of you who is in a place of influence over children have that same responsibility. Daniel lived a long time ago, but his example remains as fresh and as relevant today as it ever was. Despite overwhelming pressures, this courageous teen resisted evil and tenaciously clung to faith in the God of Israel. As in any age, I am convinced that one of the most potent pressures he had to overcome was peer pressure. Daniel had to withstand the constant urgings of the 70 other Jewish captives to go along with the program. He was no doubt encouraged to give in, stop making waves, to get on board and make things safe for everyone. Never doubt it. Peer pressure is powerful, especially on those approaching adulthood. At such time, the pressure to conform reaches its zenith. During that time, they care more about their friends and think that more than anything else. They feel insecure. They want to be accepted so badly that they become highly vulnerable to group pressure. That's why someone has said that teens move in herds. They want to be part of the group. Such is the power of group pressure. It's one of the major reasons why kids try drugs and alcohol. How can we help our children to stay strong and, and to resist such a tide? How can we encourage them to follow Daniel's courageous example instead? Here's a strategy to go get on top of that problem. Fathers, Mothers, Sunday school teachers, teach, number one, the children under your care to never underestimate the importance of their choices. I think the Old Testament character Caleb was one of Daniel's heroes. Daniel and Caleb had a lot in common. See, Caleb stood up for what he believed even when everyone else ran in a different direction. Caleb's story is told in Numbers chapter 13 and Joshua chapter 14. Israel sent 12 spies into Canaan to determine whether the nation could take the land of promise. Ten of them returning spies, they whined. They said, we can't go in there. The land is filled with giants. We don't have anywhere near the power to overcome them. They're stronger than we are. Caleb and Joshua had seen the giants too. But more than that, they had heard the promise of the Lord. So when Caleb returned, he stood up in front of all the dissidents and unbelieving crowd, and he said in Numbers 13, 30, let's go up at once and let's take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. However, the opinion of the ten cowardly spies prevailed and the nation spent the next 40 years wandering around in the wilderness. Caleb was right. Majority was wrong. A single bad decision, one poor choice made in the heat of passion, cost the Israelites a whole generation. Because of their unbelief, they were sentenced to die in the wilderness. Not one of them, other than Caleb and Joshua, were allowed to see the Promised Land. On the flip side, Caleb's courage to stand for what he believed changed the course of his whole life and of that of his family. 
Sometimes we think it doesn't make any difference the choices we make. It's just one choice, just one decision, but it does make a big, big difference. Help your child to see the critical importance of his choices by setting a good example yourself. Every choice he makes in some way changes what he is inside. Every time he decides to do something wrong, he does something to himself that makes it easier for him to respond wrongly the next time. But every time he decides to do what is right, he builds something in his inner character that will help him become more who he ought to be. Number two, help your child to decide his convictions before he faces the choice. The Bible never hints that Daniel and his friends struggled with what to do when they were offered the king's wine and meat. They already held firm convictions on the matter. Daniel didn't have to try and start from scratch and scrabble out a game plan to meet the crisis at that moment. He already knew that eating from the king's table would violate who he was before God. He made his choice long before the choice had to be made. That's a good, good policy to follow. Encourage your child to get his convictions from his love for God and from God's Word. Last week I spoke about knowing and cherishing the Bible, and I emphasized the importance of scriptural memorization. What a good thing to encourage your children. Key verses they memorize can help them when the pressure comes. Most importantly, help your child to make the right decision before he has to make it. That way, when the crisis comes, he or she will simply be enforcing a decision, not making one. It's much easier to enforce a decision than to make a tough choice under pressure. Number three, train your child to determine the risk factor in every situation. Every one of us is smart enough to know where trouble lies. When your child's heart starts sending him signals that something looks a little shady, that is his warning. Train him to get out fast. Walking into a high-risk situation makes no sense whatsoever for anyone who wants to stay clean and true in the things of God. Train your child to ask, is this place where I belong? Is this the kind of thing I need? Number four, show your child how to depend on God every day. I believe that peer pressure has become so overpowering today that it is rare for a teen to be able to cope with it apart from the Lord's help. If your child doesn't depend on God, if he doesn't ask God to give him the strength he needs to stand up and be counted, he will risk a ruined life. Here's where I think Daniel's three friends prove it. In chapter three of Daniel, Daniel has moved out of view. His buddies have taken over center stage. King Nebuchadnezzar built a huge golden idol to which everyone in the kingdom was supposed to bow down and worship. And everyone did except these three teens. Do you realize how badly you stick out in a crowd when everyone is bowing down while you're standing up? Suddenly these three men found themselves in big, big trouble. They knew if they didn't bow down, they would be thrown into a fiery furnace. How did they respond when the thermo thermostat got turned up? I love the words of Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand. O king, but if not, let it be known to you that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image 
which you have set up. You see, they were saying in essence, we don't care about the penalty or the circumstances. We're going to do what's right. We're going to stand for God. In the end, God did rescue them. The only thing they got burnt was the ropes that tied the boys' hands together. Number five, encourage your child to develop friends who stand with him or her. I have noticed people in the Bible who stood strong for God often stood with other people. Such friendships aren't hard to recall. Think of people like Paul and Silas, Peter and John, David and Jonathan, Paul and Luke, Joshua and Caleb, Daniel and his three friends. And isn't it interesting in the Gospel of Luke chapter 10, when the Lord sent out the group of 72 disciples, he sent them out two by two. There's great strength in even one ally. Remind your child that many years from now, it won't matter if he, his or her friends were popular or athletic. What matters is their commitment to God. If your child develops friendships with others who want to please God, those friendships can strengthen and help him as he moves through the difficult teen years. And lastly, number six, motivate your child to declare his decision with courage. Like Daniel, Joseph faced temptation in every stage of his life. He stood alone against his brothers. He stood alone against the promiscuous culture of his day. In Daniel's case, 70 hostages came out of Jerusalem. They were taken to Babylon. Daniel, Mishael, Shadrach, and Abednego are the four of them. Can you name even one of the others? I guess not. Why not? They're forgotten and gone. The same is true of the spies who accompanied Joshua and Caleb into the Promised Land. You can't give me the name of even one person in that group, can you? Why not? Because once again, they're all gone and forgotten. But the men who stood up for God will be remembered forever. <clears throat> the desire for popularity now often puts at risk being remembered later. Neither you nor your child can make something out of his life without the courage to swim upstream, to say no when everybody else is saying yes. See, Daniel is an example to all of us, regardless of what we do or where we live. Success does not depend on compromising our commitments. I believe our world is hungry for individuals who will stand and say, all be like Daniel. All stand as he stood. All draw the line where God draws the line, no matter what. Will you be that person? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of Daniel. We thank you for the way that he was able to take a stand in a very difficult and trying situation. We think of our young people, we think of adults, we think of the pressure, the peer pressure that is out there to compromise. And we pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us to take our stand when we need to take that stand and to trust you for the end result. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.